to properly address anthropogenic global warming, we have to address nuclear weapons and militarization at a larger scale. And that also requires addressing heterosexism, notions of masculinity, and notions of violence, deterrence, and credibility, all of which are grounded in heterosexual imaginaries in our nation. Welcome to My Nuclear Life. I'm Shelley Lesher. Today on the podcast, I'm speaking with Martin Pfeiffer, a PhD student in anthropology at the University of New Mexico. Marty is best known by his 17,000 plus followers on Twitter by his handle at Nuclear Anthro. Using this medium, he tackles everything from nuclear deterrence to Santa's place in the Cold War, all with a sarcasm fitting of his belief and always with an eye towards social justice. And cats. There are lots of cat pictures, which is really what the internet does best. Before we begin, I would like to give you a background on a couple of items we discussed during the podcast. The first is FOIA, which we discuss extensively. FOIA refers to the Freedom of Information Act, which allows citizens to request information from their governments and is meant to allow for a more transparent governmental system. There are different types of these acts in most democratic societies. In the U.S., the policy of full disclosure has been in effect since the late 1960s. Of course, there are exclusions to FOIA. You won't be given access to classified information, open case files from law enforcement, trade secrets, foreign policies, stuff like that. But you will hear from our conversation that is not really how the federal agencies are practicing FOIA. Next, the Open Skies Treaty is mentioned multiple times, but never actually explained. This treaty allows for all signatories to conduct unarmed reconnaissance flights over each other's territories. What's the purpose of these flights? It's to collect information on military forces and activities. Although this idea was initially proposed by Eisenhower between the U.S. and the Soviet Union in 1955, it didn't gain traction until George H.W. Bush revived it in 1989. The current treaty entered into force on the first of the year in 2002. Why is it mentioned in this podcast? It's thought to be a way of reducing the chances of accidental war, and of course, by extension, nuclear war, and to build trust through transparency. The Trump administration withdrew the U.S. from the treaty in November of 2020. Two months later, Russia announced they would also leave the Open Skies Treaty, but in February hinted they would return if the U.S. did the same. Stay tuned at the end of my conversation with Marty for an opportunity to access bonus content from the show and receive some podcast swag. I had great fun talking to Marty about all things nuclear, including heritage sites, how queer theory intersects with nuclear anthropology, and the amazing archive he has curated. You will hear how I got caught up with some newsletters on his archive. It really is a rabbit hole. There are not many nuclear anthropologists around, so I asked what I thought was a simple question. Turns out, there was not a simple answer. I want to know what nuclear anthropology actually is. I don't know anymore, if I ever knew. Why aren't you in the history department? Like, why are you a nuclear anthropologist and not a nuclear historian, for example? For one thing, and as historians will tell you themselves, they generally lack theory. And in taking classes with them, that has been a matter of enormous annoyance, vexation, and distress. One thing I enjoy about historians is that you don't have to show any contribution to theory or to method or whatever. You can say, look, nobody has ever talked about this before. Here I am. Publish this. In anthropology, depending on whom you need money from. So, for instance, the National Science Foundation requires that for the dissertation improvement research grant that my work be driving forward theoretical 
foundations in the field of anthropology, which I will do in part through the new articulations of queer methodology and an expansion of theoretical and analytical concepts in the field in anthropology period. How does nuclear issues push forward queer theory? You know that nuclear family that the uh, United States is so focused on as being the supposed bedrock of our entire everything? Yes. Yeah. Would you like to guess when that got really popular? 1955. So the term itself, I've not been able to track down an exact date, but it seems to be early 1900s, late 1800s. So the nuclear family, I mean, is the nuclear family. It's also less than about 5% of all kinship arrangements as of contemporary state contact. It gets messy when you start trying to to talk about that because, of course, it was, you know, highly colonial and colonial encounters in the past and disease would just kill entire groups of people and then the economy changes and people bring stuff in and so on. But in part because of its massive consumptive capabilities, it seems to be dispreferred. And the U.S., in part to distinguish ourselves from those godless socialist commies, and in part as a further development and intensification of our naturally atomistic, distrustful to the nuclear family, I would argue, and its prototypical arrangements of gender and sex and class and race and so many other things are extraordinarily the product of the nuclear age and certainly nuclear weapons. So remember, the Red Scare was fired more people for alleged sexual misconduct for being queer up until Clinton, per se. You could not get a security clearance if you were gay by trans. The bomb has always been a heterosexual project in the United States, predominantly over hegemonically, and continues to be. Even the whole writing the bomb down, bomb as It always bugged me when Teller was waiting for Ivy Mike, the telegram. It's a boy. And I'm like, what's wrong with it's a girl? Nope, it's a boy. And that was consistent and repeated throughout, you know, when Trinity went off and they sent the telegram to Truman that it was a boy and that you could hear its yells all the way out to the ranch and blah, 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 sort of thing. So there's a book by Brian Eastman, I want to say, and it's called Fathering the Unthinkable. And I'm certain that there's a book by a woman that makes very similar arguments. However, it's also, it's difficult to find, Fathering the Unthinkable, but it goes through an extraordinary detail like, hey, look, this is Bacodian science. It's all about penetrating. It was furthermore fully understood in this way by the people involved. Like it's always been very, very masculinized, penetrating, ripping away the bomb as a masculine heterosexual project in America, right? We've had these consistent crises of masculinity constantly. And they become so important because if the Russians don't think we'll destroy the world, right? So essentially, what what I'm about to say, you know, as a queer man, right? Diplomacy is for or pansies, cookie pushers in striped pants, as people used to refer to the State Department and probably still do. Really? Yeah. So the book, The Lavender Scare. I was going to mention that I have heard of The Lavender Scare. The book is astounding. It's wonderful to read. I strongly recommend it. And in fact, the, the whole McCarthy thing developed in significant part out of people going for their political <clears throat> at the State Department and then somebody admitting that they had fired sex perverts and then it became a sex pervert scare. And then sex perverts were alleged to be uniquely whatever, open to blackmail. And of course, the other historiography on it coming out under fire also points out that the acceptance or willingness to overlook non-normative sexualities at the time or sexual expressions at the time varied almost directly with people power needs and how well those were being met at the time. And that also at the same time, GI Bill of Rights and other things, including the sense of having fought for the country, participated in a great patriotic endeavor, and then being forbidden the benefits of it because you were discharged for being same-sex oriented or whatever. I want to go back to the nuclear family. So a lot of things were being introduced in the U.S. in kind of the early mid-50s, the whole in God we trust being put on the money and the Pledge of Allegiance being said in the classroom. And 
the fight of communism were different because we're God-fearing Americans. Is that the same time when kind of the nuclear family comes about? What I can say is that the term itself existed prior to the end of World War II, and that after World War II, at least, it its prevalence and its importance in American ideological discourses in part as ways of separating us from the communist, the supposedly communist Soviet Russia. And of course, the McMahon report, so it also got tied up as a way to beat up racialized minorities or underrepresented minorities, whatever term you want to use there, racialized groups. So yeah, by the 50s or 60s, certainly by then, the structure of the family had been imbricated and articulated it had been articulated into those other discursive formations as being critical again you're using it to beat up black families what i can say is i can't point to exactly when but i can say that there was a strong intensification and it has been incredibly damaging to our society economy environment our way of life everything sorry to pop in but we wanted to make a quick correction Marty mentioned the McMahon report, but what he meant to say was the Moynihan report. Very, very briefly, in 1965, a report on African-American families titled The Negro Family, The Case for National Action, was released from the office of the Assistant Secretary of Labor, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. It made it known that civil rights legislation was not enough to produce racial equality. More needed to be done but it became an extremely controversial document. I highly recommend you read it for yourself, so I've included the link on our website. One of the things that makes it both queer and nuclear anthropology is that I'm asking, how do these sites of official heritage and imaginaries of masculinity, femininity, heterosexuality, how do these imaginaries shape our beliefs about the past, present, and future of nuclear use and nuclear weapon production? And how we imagine that we might use these weapons in the future and against whom and how we might build them in the future and what it means nationally to have nuclear weapons or not. Does it mean that we get to swing around a big metaphorical and call it deterrence, which is what we've been doing because there is no deterrence. Deterrence is an analytically idealized version of nuclear compellence relations that is never fully realized in practice. And certainly we can see that in the history of U.S. nuclear weapons, but that's not what really gets shown in official heritage sites. Generally, what gets downplayed in these official heritage sites include things like the abandoned uranium mines on Navajo Nation, how uranium mining built off previous genocidal projects and colonialism and contributed to them, how, God, what we did at Hanford, you know, and as a national sacrifice, what we did at Oak Ridge, I mean, just everywhere. And so I've long argued that we would not have, and it's, there's no question to it, that we would not have been able to build the Cold War arsenal that we did under the current environmental safety and health guidelines that we have now. And this is well recognized by the people in the complex and they complain about it constantly. And so as we are refurbishing and building new weapons, it's turning out we we're spending more on the labs than we were during the Cold War, and that's part of it. And the answer is not relax ESH, because we've seen what a disaster that is. To me, the answer is, let's cut down on the bombs and the entire world system that leaves us with a doomsday machine. I want to ask you about why you have concentrated some of your work on Sandia National Lab. And it's odd, because to an extent, I haven't had it. Sandia is the least written about, least studied nuclear weapon laboratory of the three, Lawrence Livermore, Los Alamos, and Sandia. And certainly compared to Hanford and some of the other sites, the the atomic Nevada test site now in NSS. Sandia and Kirtland and the nuclear weapon complex period have had an enormous set of impacts, shaping of the entire history for the last 50 years plus, 70 years plus of New Mexico. DOE money, I believe, has consistently been the single largest source of employer money here, DOE and DOD certainly combined. And I've also seen very little written, for instance, about how the presence of people from the labs and from Kirtland have impacted local and state politics in terms of their voting here. But that's probably not something I'm going to do. One of the things that the newsletters perhaps allow me to explore somewhat also are how Sandia regards its, or doesn't regard it, 
as having a responsibility to the area and to Albuquerque itself. Okay, hold on. So let's rewind a little bit. Could you tell me where Sandia is located and what it actually does? Yeah, so Sandia is located about seven miles as the thermal pulse flies away from me. In Albuquerque? Yes, just on the outskirts. Sandia developed, it was Z Division, it developed when they started moving stuff even in the summer of 45 out of Los Alamos to Albuquerque, including some uh, high explosives and also some weapon assembly responsibility and also some component production assembly, component production responsibilities, all of which Sandia had largely chunked by the mid-1950s and was more involved in design. Sandia is responsible for the weaponization of the phys- quote-unquote physics packages that the other labs create. So Los Alamos says, hey, if you do A, B, and C with these high explosives, this fissile material, and this, it'll go boom. Now, we also want to be able to drop it from 30,000 feet and have it penetrate 120 feet of reinforced concrete. Can you do that for us? And Sandia says, with enough money, yes. And then they do that. So I thought Livermore and Los Alamos design the bombs, but Sandia does as well? Sandia is responsible for the non-nuclear components. Okay, so you had requested years of Sandia newsletters. They tried not to give them to me. Did you ask why? Why did you request these newsletters? It seems like a kind of odd thing to ask for. And even, well, you had to know they existed, first of all. Uh huh. Because it currently exists. And it said that it had a publishing history from whenever to whenever. And I learned, like, hey, if I want access to these, how do I get them? And I emailed the historian. And the historian, who uh, was very polite in answering my email that one time, and is apparently very polite and pleasant with other people with whom they have good relationships. In any case, told me that normally you make requests to the Freedom of Information Act to access never classified documents in the unclassified archives. So I did. And they seemed not thrilled about that. And it took a year and a half. And they tried to charge me $1,000 for duplication fees, even though they were digitized when I requested them and under an amendment to the FOIA for exactly this reason. If you request digitized records in digitized form, they have to give them to you in digitized form and you can't charge for duplication except for CDs or whatever, right? So they were basically trying to say, I had to file an entire additional Freedom of Information Act as to the digitized or non-digitized status of the records I was requesting under my other Freedom of Information Act, at which point in an essay said, okay, we're done and gave me what I wanted. So why didn't they want to give them to you? I don't know. I'm suing them right now in any case, because they continued that sort of behavior. And it's feebling where they're attempting to, despite being textbook case as where I should be included under UNM's fee status. And then also through my journalist and other activities, I should be counted as a member of the news media or representative of the news media. However, NSA and DOE are arguing horribly poorly, like I was amazed. What happens is, is that you have to go through their administrative process. And then, okay. so you, let's say that you start with NSA, Nuclear, National Nuclear Security Agency, admin, I never remember, because that's where you send your FOIAs for Sandia. And they say, no, you have to pay for everything because you're a commercial requester, even though I'm very clearly not. And then you appeal to DOE. And DOE, which are the bosses of the people doing the bad thing, DOE's job is to come up with a reason why the bad people doing the bad thing who keep doing the bad thing, it seems. And they do, and the reasoning is bizarre. And then it's usually a $10,000... What kind of reasons do they give you? I have a Patreon is their big one. And then another one was, oh, he makes more than the minimum. It's it's just... uh, Wait, wait, wait. You make more than minimum wage? From my Patreon, which is... And it's just like, why does that matter? And like, they don't engage the case law in my experience. It's the public documents are posted so far to my OSF, actually. So I would direct everyone to those and say that anything that I've said in this conversation that may vary from those was a misstatement and mis error from what we have written in the documents themselves. Okay. Um, yeah, sometimes it's hard to remember everything. 
you know, and it's been going on for so long. In any case, so I was fortunate enough to hook up with the Harvard Cyber Law Clinic. The clinical instructor I'm working with and the students I've worked with are amazing, compassionate, hardworking, terrifyingly skillful people. Uh, and so usually I close emails with, I look forward to our imminent victory. And I do, because like after you go through the administrative appeals, usually it's a $10,000 pay to play. And that's part of the governmentality impact of, you know, they're not being very good oversight over the FOIA process. So if you believe, as I did, that the point of the Freedom of Information Act is to distribute information about the U.S. government to U.S. citizens, madam, I would like to disabuse you of that notion immediately. It most certainly is not, at least not well, the people I've asked. That's the point of Supposedly. FOIA ostensibly in practice but it sounds like the it's a the doe is trying to make that is every agency so every agency is trying to make that as difficult as possible it so depends. that you just give up it's more than that when i say it's a tactic of governmentality i mean that it's one way that the u.s government in a manner that is fractally recursive and it certainly seemed to get worse as the trump regime established itself in power and became more bellicose. I'm in power and I do what I want because it, it trickles down. So it becomes the, the process of the Freedom of Information Act becomes a tactic of constructing relationships between you and the government and you and those particular members of the government and what information you have the right to and what information you, despite the law, you're being told no about, right? And so I will say that like, yeah, there have been periods of Incredible anger, annoyance, frustration, sobbing. I mean, it's gaslighting. So I, I have gone through periods where I thought I was wrong. And I've literally asked my lawyers, like, look, I'm not the one who's wrong. And they're like, no, no, like, you know, it's, they get in your mind. But doesn't that just make you want to fight harder? It does me. But I'm a graduate student and a journalist. And there's this thing that, as I describe it, there are things that I feel strongly about morally. And then there are things that really f me off. <laughs> and at that intersection is where you do not want to find yourself. DOE and FOIA is squarely at that intersection, I'm guessing. More than my desire with DOE and the FOIA and my lawsuit is for justice and for that the law be carried out. And that is my, you know, my desire with that. And I'm sure you understand if there's something that's classified and they can't give you. Of course, but then you, under the FOIA, you ask for all reasonably segregable elements. And so, for instance, like with the newsletters, which were never classified, did not require classified review, to drag feet on providing those. Why? Again, governmentality. You know, we're not just here to give you whatever you want, whatever you want. Similarly, getting pictures of plutonium tetrafluoride which Wikipedia now has. You're welcome, America and the world. And it's important, I feel, that we know the chemical processes through which our weapons are made. And I mean, those were declassified. And as part of that, it's like, this is called pink cake. Okay, I'd like to see what that looks like. Why are there no pictures of what these things look like so that I can actually bring it down from nuclear weapons as this ethereal, sublime object into here are the chemical components of it as they go through the plutonium production process. And to get pictures of pink cake from Los Alamos, like they tried giving me just one. Los Alamos, one picture of pink cake. We've talked about these newsletters. And yeah. I have uh, and the newsletters. It's from 1951 from... to 1997, I think, want to say. And I have there available. If you would please, if you search Martin Pfeiffer OSF or Martin Pfeiffer Nash. So I really, I went, hardcore hubris when I named it grandly, the Pfeiffer Nuclear and National Security Digital Archive. As it's a great archive. It yeah, is. I Thank will, I will link it on the podcast. Okay. So, and you can go there and find 46 years of these newsletters, which I have now conglomerated into one year per PDF, which has made it so much easier. They are, they are amazing. I went down a rabbit hole when I found these and just... How many years did you look at? Or name uh, name your five top things that like. Okay. I, I took screenshots so I could share them with you. Excellent. I love hearing this from um, other people. My favorite was. For a certain value the, of that term. 
Around the Department News. Yeah. So our listeners know these are the newsletters that come out monthly. I think they were every two weeks. Were they? Uh, if they changed over time also. Okay, so either bi-monthly or monthly, so that people in the lab knew what other people in the lab were doing, basically. And it's kind of like a hometown newspaper. It's Especially early it's, on. Yeah. 51, I think, the first year is, I think, my favorite one. Is that the one with the black face? No, no, okay. that is not, I don't think. But life was boring. Yeah, extremely. There was nothing Around the departments, there is a lot about fishing. Yeah. It seems that everybody is fishing or not fishing or not catching any fish. For example, several fishermen in 2234 have been trying their luck at the sport. All they have to show for it are sunburns. Oh. That is in the Around the Department news. Yes. They also were really in the early ones. Like You don't see very much about nuclear per se. And then in the, the later years, they get really big on like, here's a picture of, uh, you know, proud Sandians holding a Star Spangled Banner painted B-61 nuclear weapon casing. Oh, I haven't got, I just kept reading around the department because Henry is building a wall around his yard while on his vacation. I mean, Jesus Christ, no wonder they were wanting to build nuclear weapons. <laughs> like, fuck, Yeah. So it's fascinating it, when you look at the ads, the ads lie. The recruitment advertisements lie. They say there's plenty of housing. There wasn't plenty of housing until the 60s, if then. They present this neo-colonial, semi-tame, quote-unquote, like, Wild West thing where they really, the way, how they talk about the Pueblos and indigenous and native peoples is, you can imagine it's the myth of them as like vanishing, as having being this like quaint way of life that just were you know hungry for tourist dollars and that you could experience. And so you had this this mix of hyper modern and the ancient, and of course the atomic bomb is the apotheosis of the hyper modern. And Los Alamos was doing the same, like leisurely living, and it's this man on horseback. And these beautiful scenes, and then there's this discussion of all the hyper-advanced computer technology. It's not hyper-advanced now. Computer technology and such that they had. And so, they're, they're, you know, it's the modernist myth and of the past always fading into the pre-modern past history and the inexorable progress of history. And along the way, you know, indigenous and native peoples are squeezed into jelly and exterminated. Well, I mean, you can go visit them in their native habitat. Exactly. You that was definitely sh seen in the newsletters when they had the around yeah. Albuquerque, what you can do on, on a weekend. Everybody was bored out of their skull. And I have no doubt that, you know, right. And they are sexist. My God. Like, what's the first thing you look for in a mate at work? And it's like, this is... This, this. Well, and there are marriage announcements, of course, because uh, but only the women. Yes. And it's amazing that everybody's from out of town. Everybody complains about their garden or lack thereof. And so you can literally yes. look at the cartoons and the early years and 20 years later, find almost exactly the same cartoon of somebody complaining about their front yard. And it's like, just get over it. Just get over it. Uh, you live in the desert. Right? You're oh, not God. You're going to have a garden. <laughs> And the, no, the complaints about the weather and just other things. And it's just, yeah. So because you were rotating through and rather in, than investing in the capability of producing your workforce in the local area, you just imported them. And of course, this has contributed to a significant asymmetry in terms of how DOD largesse and funds and benefits and costs have been distributed with Native Indigenous people getting over and colonized peoples getting over repeatedly and the most wow i was having fun with these letters but that's yeah, just a so downer some other really cool stuff in it well i mean they get really racist well the classified oh, ads are amazing you could buy a brand new smith and wesson for 2270 right well you can get an unfurnished two-bedroom house with a stove and refrigerator for 90 dollars a month how's yeah. your rent looking much more than that. Like I said, they were lying in the advertisements. Post-war housing shortage lasted well into the 50s. 
And the advertisements that I look at for Sandia are big on plenty of housing, modern schools and such. And they were lying through their teeth. Straight really? Up. There wasn't like no. You, you wouldn't. You don't think that? House. Oh, constant complaints about housing in the newsletter. Constant in the fifties. Another thing, you actually those may be a little bit more in the oral narratives, and less so in the newsletter. The because... complaints about housing, yeah, because they may not have made it. Sorry, sometimes it's difficult to keep track of which sort. This yes. is why we write it down. Well, we try supposedly. to keep it upbeat because here is another good one because of course there's an inquiring reporter right they always ask people yes. what a question yes here's a good one should husbands help their wives at home i just want to vomit <laughs> and there's no you they're all white or almost all white and no they're all white the promotions are usually always men and it's so finding out what those little digit codes are led me to request some telephone books. And I was told that if I reduced my request, then they do a you know rolling rollout. And they lied. So um, I'm going to wait till the lawsuit's over till we do that. One of my favorites in there is our, um, apparently they had a problem with, it happened more than once and possibly three or four or five times where sunlight would come through the window of various parts of the lab and then be concentrated through liquids in beakers and start fires. Oh, yay. So, yeah, it's a, I never had thought about that. Like, okay, good to know. Now I'm like super worried about it. Um, I don't think you have anything that would cause a fire. Apparently crystal balls can do it. I don't have a crystal ball. Did you like huh. leave it on your table and then the sun goes through it at the right direction and it's big enough? So the way that I look at the newsletter is right. Why do they matter? And for one thing, from the historian's perspective, I can just say they weren't accessible to people and now they are. From an anthropological perspective, I can also add that they offer us a way of looking at change, continuity, transparency, and an examination of a hitherto under-examined site critical to the nuclear weapons complex and a perspective that is horrifically understudied. I mean, I don't know anybody that's done any work with the newsletters at Los Alamos or at Lawrence Livermore even, despite there being literally decades of them. And so, as you pointed out, corpus analysis of this could be super productive for those linguistic anthropologists who are so inclined. Or me, once I have the money in a new computer, that doesn't take an hour to start up. Well, and if you really want to know the difference between a poodle haircut and a pony, this <laughs> newsletter will tell you. So one thing that is... I'm sorry, I have to close this or I will just be going okay. through and asking you questions from this the whole whole entire time but do i do know. encourage people to look through it because it is fascinating and later on you get a real sense of where the weapons complex was and what it was working on and then also that the labs really do not approve of testing moratoria or ending testing and then now you know we can talk about how the labs feel about resuming testing but they sure did not want to stop it at any point, according to those newsletters. Um, of course they didn't. No, no. I mean, it's also clear in the advertisements, I would argue, that the, one of the changes that happens in Sandia newsletter ads is, is related to the moratorium. And then later on, you also get this really, you know, they were pedal to the metal at the end of the Cold War. Like, you know, we got the 89, we got the, you know, da -da -da -da, the 90, and the da -da 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 -da, and then it just went wham. It's also fascinating to me to see the stories of technology exchange, and some of those weren't told until later. So, like, Cynthia created the clean room, radiation-hardened electronics. Guess who was a world leader in that? Well, yeah, because you have to be, you know, because you have to survive both your own bombs and other people's bombs and your electronics sitting next to the pit for, for however long. And it's really fascinating, I think, also to see the civilian advertisements by the people who are making rad hard electronics. So the notion that it was capitalist ingenuity that saw us through the Cold War, and it's like, no, we were pumping vast amounts of government knowledge and R&D money and effort. It has never been an issue of capitalism somehow being more inventive or whatever. It's like, well, we put forth the resources. And Sandia yes. shared them. And now, I mean, the entire lab complex is explicitly identified in part and its value, both as a sort of distributed deterrent system. 
If we can demonstrate a broad-based scientific capability such that our adversaries will believe that we can respond to potential problems in the nuclear weapons stockpile. And in addition, they're identified explicitly as being technology development and transfer centers. Well, I think the other interesting thing about the newsletters is I used to work in a national lab, so I have a perspective on lab culture. I think the newsletters give people a little insight about what a scientific lab is like. So in that sense, I think it's pretty interesting for people outside of science to see what it's like inside that environment. And it's self-presentational, obvious. also. It's obviously. It's an odd presentation to begin with, even yeah. someone who, who has seen the inside. It's still an interesting presentation, Yeah, and, knowing and, what the inside looks like. And I'd say it keeps that without necessarily the same degree of knowledge. It remains that way up through the period that I had requested. It's both self-presentational. It's propaganda. Just like why does United States Strategic Command, why are there n- nuclear-armed Twitter accounts? It's propaganda, mostly aimed at us. But I think the newsletters are also a little bit of kind of what newsletters are always meant to yeah. be, which is to keep people together and to be cooperative and to try to get a sense yeah. of community. It's and, a range of audiences and purposes. Right, right. And, and they those don't newsletters, always mesh. Yeah. And those newsletters do give you a sense of community, even if it's a very one-dimensional community. It's and, still a sense of community. And very much rooted in the construction, valuation, and reproduction of a quote-unquote nuclear family. Absolutely. In this sense, Absolutely. literally a nuclear Literally, yes. Family. Which should have been the name of the newsletter. Sandia Lab News. Uh, yeah, no. I mean, what, the nuclear family? That would have been a good one. Oh, God, that would have been... Oh, so to go back to one thing that we... That it was, yes, so, that sorry. should have been the name of the newsletter, the Sandia Nuclear Family. I, yes. Don't tell them that because now they'll change it and it'll be like that much better. And, you know, no help to the lab, you know, but... That could be the title of a chapter of your thesis. Sandia Nuclear yeah, Okay. The Thunderbird logo was the result of these employee contests, like, come up with these security posters, and not all of them were winners. I didn't see the security posters. I love security posters. Send you the link. And they f***ed me over on them. They did one of those, oh, let's go to Google security, and it's like, okay, I see. So when I get my FOIA powers back, it's going to be like, all right, all security posters created by this department, and I'm going to send the letter you know, from the newsletter. So this is one of the areas that those newsletters are really useful is for identifying like what departments did what so that they can't be like, we just did a broad search. You can be like, hi, no, I need you to search this department and its archives to find me these files instead of just like sending me nothing. Okay. You mentioned you don't have your FOIA powers. What does that mean? It means that they're continuing to illegally block me until my inexorable victory. (laughs) <laughs> so once you filed your lawsuit, they said you couldn't make any FOIA requests? I can make requests. They're just going to continue categorizing me as a commercial requester, which prices me out of any requests. As a commercial requester, you have to pay for search, even if you find nothing. And so one of the requests, hey, I want to know about your plan for a artillery-fired, earth-penetrating weapon back in the 50s. And they say, you're a commercial requester, therefore it's going to cost us $1,000 to look, just to look. And then if we find anything, it's 10 cents per page and da 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 So you have to guarantee to pay 5000 for instance, and you have to pay 2500 up front. Yeah, wow. they've, they've been really not pleasant about it, and it's been infuriating in some cases. And again, it's about governmentality and, and getting people to not use it in the way that's not fun to be used for them. Do you expect a change with the new administration? maybe it's possible i want to talk about your archive a little bit what is your favorite piece in the archive the advertisements are un- un- unusual and close to unique if not unique source that i find mind-blowing and fascinating do you have a favorite advertisement The euphemistically stated studying the curve of the binding energy of atoms underlies everything we do at Los Alamos and their line of ads that got artists from Taos to do like 
artist interpretations of things like clandestine nuclear proliferation that does not artistically translate very well. So, yeah, that's a little weird. Like, there's one that's about, uh, I want to say, exploration and excitement and creativity. And there are two faces and it's screaming, it looks like, and it's just dark and totally not, not fitting. The ads also get really racist and colonial. So this was a time that Los Alamos was, what, advertising for employees? Or they were trying to make people like them? What were they ever... Okay. It was self-presentational. It was propaganda. It was for employees. Because they don't have to advertise for scientists anymore. They did at the time. So it depends on whom you ask. Common Sense says, and the U.S. Department of Labor Statistics, Bureau of Labor Statistics, also suggests that there was, in fact, a demand, a competition for certain technically trained people, Rand, whom we should all, right, we should always take with a grain of salt. They do great work sometimes, but Rand suggests that, no, it was a matter of how government contracts, were, the argument is really weird to me, it was a matter of how government contracts were being let such that it was easier to like have a bunch of people on call and then you could like just not hire it. It was weird. I don't think that that's the answer. I think it's a combination of all three. But I think that Sandia, when they were doing their, our product is not for sale, you know, deterrence ads, were, that's right around the moratoria. And then later Los Alamos did some similar ads and I'm not sure what that's about. I would need to spend some more time in the later periods of Los Alamos ads to analyze those. Otherwise, I'd definitely say the newsletters are a unique... And I mean, I put these things together in part because I want them to be used. One thing I'm particularly proud of is that I've spent hundreds of hours scanning and curating and making readable documents that were released to other people through the Freedom of Information Act that were posted by the DOE online to their online reading room and that were then corrupted and taken down and basically made unavailable again. So I have reconstituted thousands of pages of that collection, not the entire collection, but thousands of pages. And these includes, for instance, a set of standardized history reports, for example, for every weapon, basically, from the Mark V to the B-61. Wow. I have posted online, rather than the standard narrative history of Broken Arrows, I have posted online two previously unavailable accounts of, you know, U.S. nuclear weapon accidents. One of them's up until 70, whatever, and the other's up until whatever. I have, through the Freedom of Information Act, posted three documents on the Nuclear Weapon Instructional Museum, which most people don't know what it is or what it exists, and will never see it. And it's the museum on base that there are two versions. There's the unclassified version, then the classified version, which has, like, all the cutouts. Did you get to do the classified version? Okay. I always heard about this museum, well, and I wanted to go when I got my clearance. And then once I had my clearance, I never had the opportunity to go, and so now, I missed my window. There are three, count them, three unclassified tours available online on my OSA collection. Three. But I wanted to do the classified I Well, tour. I'm sorry. You know, they're not going to let me post that. However, those documents do include some of the first pictures, for example, of the W61 facing released to the public. Okay, how have we not blown ourselves up yet? A significant amount of it was luck. An unappreciated amount of it were the restrictions forced by mass movements and the peace movement onto various governments around the world to do and not do certain things and to approach the topic itself in certain ways. And that, to me, is one of the greatest and most egregious and harmful absences in official nuclear weapons heritage, is that we do not present to people a narrative, right? There are little tidbits of like, oh, people got upset about nuclear weapons in the 80s. There's no, okay, this is when they got upset. This is what they were upset about. This is what they did. These are the policy impacts they had. Hey, here's a model for how we could do it now. Like it's instead, again, nuclear policy and nuclear weapons are generally presented as being sublime, ethereal, outside the reach of the normal person. And U.S. nuclear weapons activities as being completely justified as a response to those perfidious Soviets and the drive of technology and the geopolitics of the situation, rather than 
driven by our own labs in part and our own military in part and by really 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 intelligence analyses that were enabled by not having things like the open skies treaty i know that your listeners can't see my face right now but it's extremely sarcastic <laughs> it was sarcastic i mean like <laughs> that leads into my next question which is how do you want people to use your archive or how do you think citizens should interact with the governance of the u.s nuclear weapons loudly vociferously and rooted in a understanding that we built them we can take them apart and they make us less safe than they do make us more safe and that ultimately we are going to have to especially if we are not going to die in a global warming situation like militaries are immense emitters and the u.s military in particular and you also can't do the sort of international cooperation you've got to do to respond to an existential crisis of anthropogenic global warming without also addressing the existential crises of, you know, nuclear doomsday and large scale warfare, all of which are going to fuck up your global warming stuff. I mean, mitigating, preventing and responding to anthropogenic global warming is going to require in any, if we are going to do it in any meaningful manner that isn't eco-fascism and that doesn't lead to suffering so as to be unthinkable and you know what i study i mean right <laughs> we are going to have to reformulate power and violence and our conceptualizations of our shared humanity and yeah that's kind of utopic and yep at the end of the day i am a fanatic utopian that hides it you know underneath my crunchy candy shell but you think that nuclear weapons play a, a role in that? I think that nuclear weapons, that nuclear disarmament and that security issues are inherently implicated with anthropogenic global warming issues, both because as AGW spins up, it's going to destabilize a security environment that needs great change, yes, and not like we've done for the last four years, but no matter what, Again, to properly address anthropogenic global warming, we have to address nuclear weapons and militarization at a larger scale. And that also requires addressing heterosexism, notions of masculinity, and notions of violence, deterrence, and credibility, all of which are grounded in heterosexual imaginaries in our nation. And in the last four years in particular, looking at Pompeo and Swagger, and sorry, again, your listeners can't see my sassy head motions. I got a swagger. It yeah. was it was a nice swagger, yeah, by the way. Like he should have just been like, I just like jewels, you know, show up in a nice suit, like covered in jewels, you know, whatever. That would have been more swaggery or like gold lame or something like that. I was thinking a jeweled cape. Yeah, oh, oh, God, I want one of those. I mean, that would have been much better than Trump threatening to nuke the North Koreans on Twitter and at the U.N., but the last four years have been a master's class in the role of heterosexist imaginaries and misogyny and homophobia and, in the conduct of and, international relations. Yeah, the and just masculine bravado, just the oh, whole... And how many of the people in Trump's cabinet are women? How many of the people in those meetings have been women? How many of the... Like, it's almost all men. It's incredibly <laughs> disproportionate. And yeah. so, again, like, so when you ask, what, do you, what do you, does queer theory have to do with nuclear weapons? It's a great question that a lot of people have. And it has to do with them because heterosexism and masculinist imaginaries of violence, force, compellence, and deterrence. And remembering, of course, there is no deterrence. Deterrence is only an analytically idealized subset of nuclear compellent relationships are grounded, foundationalized in a rejection of certain forms of diplomacy, or rather a refounding of diplomacy in particular forms of nuclear force and responsiveness and brinksmanship, essentially. Absolutely, yeah. So, brinksmanship. As Oppenheimer said, the atomic bomb is not a very good military weapon. You can't really use it. This is in the 50s. I mean, it's true. You can't use it. And Well, you can if your other people don't have any. Which is, I mean, you can if you want to destroy everyone and everything. Well, only if other people don't follow your carefully planned escalation strategy, which involves 2,000 warheads. And how many warheads can the Russian scopes differentiate? A thousand, you know, which is maybe an apocryphal story and maybe not. 
the moment you start seeing, all right, how do we use these in limited political means is after the beginning of the 1960s, when the United States realized that Europe was going to be a melted plane of glass and that the Soviets were achieving the capability to inflict unacceptable damage to the United States itself. And in that moment, and it's, I have done Twitter threads on this. I have the National Security Archive has the documents. Like it's just very clear. The documents are absolutely explicit in, in WSM reviews and such that the goal became after we could no longer guarantee damage limitation, the goal became escalation management to terminate hostilities at the lowest level possible on terms that are still beneficial or at least not bad to the U.S. And that included that we kill more Russians than, or at least that the Russians didn't kill more of us than we did of them. And then in 76, 77, there was a discussion about like, oh, the Soviets are doing civil defense. Let's, okay, we don't aim at population per se, because that's a war crime, right? How many more people would we kill if we aimed at population per se? This is Carter. Like some of the most horrific, disgusting graphs I have ever seen in my life, you know, are adjustments from current aiming strategy to aiming at people per se. So as it is now, we kill like, I don't know, let's call it 33% of the Soviet population. What marginal increase in population killed? So from 33% to what percent did we get from aiming at population per se? 11, 33, 44%. I was looking at you like, is this a question you expect an answer to? Because did you not read my Twitter feed exhaustively before we talked? My God, I didn't have a week. Oh, it would take a lot longer than that. There are 200,000 tweets on there. Yeah, no, it's it's one of those documents I go back to again and again, because it, it shows how egregious overkill was, even by those onto epistemic means of abstracted number crunching. And that's important to remember because, in part, the Titan II, sorry, I'm doing that sarcastic grin again, the Titan II Missile Museum in Swaharita, Arizona, just denies overkill as a thing. They're like, no, we needed these nine megaton missiles, and here's why. It was a matter of making sure we had 100% target saturation, and it's like, uh huh. That's interesting. Going back to what we said earlier is that we, as the U.S., we've gone through great pains to hide anything about our nuclear arsenal that's bad from the people from the people the soviets know the russians know the chinese know everybody knows but the united states citizenry and i mean that goes back to then what your archive is all about on your archive it says that the site is to quote further increase the possibilities of citizen governance of u.s nuclear weapons activities unquote i mean that's what's on your site so you're trying to give all this information back to the people to make their own decisions And I curate it. And it's a research source. It's also a form of journalism in that it is curated through into topics. I get to select out of the massive amount of files I have, what gets put up, what gets put down. So you don't end up with 86 pictures of the Mark 54 in the um, National Museum Nuclear Science History page. That thing is taking an enormous amount of time, effort, and energy over a period of years. And it is impressive. And I do commend you for it because a lot of people will just sit on their sources and just, hate that. you know, hide them for yourself themselves. And you go and you say, OK, I really want to check this source. And you search for it and you can't find it anywhere. Fills me with rage. And it, that's part of why I have made, tried to make mine so accessible is so that people can follow my train of thought and so that they don't have to say request documents that used to be available, but then got reclassified or got altered or got lost or got whatever. Thank you. To go back to your original question or one of your original questions as to what is nuclear anthropology and why should we care? Considering... Just for the record, I didn't say why should we care. It's always implied. I was not implying it. That's fine. Well, it it, it has, there's a social implication or expectation to it. And it's a worthy question too. And I would say that in many ways, nuclear anthropology is no different from many other forms of anthropology, at least in terms of its topical selection, because as somebody else pointed out and as Gusterson quoted for his book, we are people of the bomb. Nuclear weapons are a total social fact in our society and our culture. There is virtually nowhere you can go to escape them. You have isotopes in your bones, your teeth, all throughout your body. We can use the presence of certain radioisotopes to identify art forgeries that were done after 1945. 
nuclear weapons have structured so much of your life and the, the, the shape of our society and spending priorities and the way the world is that you cannot escape from them. So in that sense, nuclear anthropology is just anthropology. As I envision it, nuclear anthropology is also directed and applied toward creating a more equitable, just world and one that is safer through engagement with things like queer theory, feminism, and other critical methods that aim to eventually nuclear abolition. And if that's not possible, then toward at least a safer place than we are now. And part of my job and the job of other nuclear anthropologists is to help figure out the way to do that. Thank you for listening to My Nuclear Life. Before you go, I wanted to let you know of an opportunity to receive bonus content, including unreleased conversations with guests and even conversations with guests not previously featured on the show. If you head over to patreon.com backslash mynuclearlife, you can sponsor us for as little as $1 a month. All levels come with podcast swag, which can include stickers, magnets, and postcards. So head over and check it out. There are other ways you can support us on our website, mynuclearlife.com. And if you haven't already, the best way to support us is free. You can do this by rating, reviewing, and subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. I would like to thank my guest, Marty, for spending a really fun afternoon discussing all things nuclear. And as always, Lexi Weghorn for her help with this podcast. Thanks for listening and tune in next time when Lucy Santos will join me to discuss the evolution of radium in consumer products, including the beauty industry. I'm Shelley Lesher, and this has been My Nuclear Life.